Good morning. God bless you. Welcome to another live broadcast. Yes, you're not seeing a ghost. This is really the pastor this time. I thank. I want to thank uh, this this time publicly to thank Susanna for giving me a break from ministering. And so I'm back. I had a four week uh, vacation and um, from preaching, and I'm back. And so we welcome all of you guys out there. Uh, I'm Pastor Curtis, and we are coming to you live from Zurich, Switzerland. Resurrection Life Church. So uh, we're going to believe that whatever God has for us, He has for you. And you can receive the same anointing, the same message, this, whatever God has for us, it's available for you also. Amen. I'm believing God to give us all the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus and ask Him to open the eyes of our understanding today. Amen. So that we can just receive and see and understand what he wants us to, to receive and understand today in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, um, um, I was saying earlier when I, um, when Suzanne and I were living in Italy, we lived in Italy for about three and a half years, uh, full time uh, preaching. And I had a car, we both had a car and we traveled over a hundred cities preaching the gospel everywhere we can go. And this is when they didn't have no cell phones. Okay. So we would all, we would, uh, we have an address and the pastor would give us the, his address. And then we went to the gas station and bought a map. And these maps were huge. And you, you're in the, you're in your car and Susie has the big old map unfolded and she's trying to find the spot there. And I'm trying to drive. I said, like, honey, I can't see the mirror. Move the map, move the map. And this is in those days, this is how you travel. And so we found the, the spot. There was no GPS. There was no, none of that stuff. It's just go drive and find this, this, this address. And every single time, we always found every address. Every single time. And so uh, what I preached there mainly, though, was uh, uh, how God would prosper you financially. And then um, the end times, the, the soon coming of Jesus. And so uh, these two subjects are really, really deep in the, and rooted in, in me and Susanna because that's all we taught. All those churches we preached at was those, mainly those two subjects. And we did other things too, but mainly those two subjects. And um, now, I'm coming, now we're coming into the 25th and 26th year since those things happened. And um, man, we're seeing more and more and more signs of the coming of the Lord. Now I want to go to slide one. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Go to slide one. Now we're going to talk about um, the, 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 the title of my message. I'm sure she's going to we'll, we'll fix that title. We're going to uh, talk about the harvest of God. Amen. And the first slide you're seeing a picture of, and I, I want you to see this. When you think of God, number one, positionally, God is looking what? Down. Right? He's looking down on the earth. Right? He's not looking up like we're looking up. He's looking down. And when God looks down, number one, he sees the earth. Right? And on the earth, there is one thing that God is particularly, particularly interested in. in slide two. And that is, um, um, see slide two? That is the harvest. Number one on the mind of God is the field. The harvest. Because, and sometimes we forget about this, we forget that God is a farmer. Amen? And a, a farmer, he always thinks about his crop and his fields. Amen? He's always thinking about that. He's thinking about what he can do. Let's go to, to, uh, to slide three. I can see this is Jesus. This is the, 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 the harvest. And the harvest is souls. The more people you get born again, right? Jesus is rejoicing. Look at my crop. Look at my crop. Look at all these people in my farm, on my vineyard. 
We're going to put all these people and what a harvest we have, Father. We, what a harvest we have. So our job as a believer is to help this God the farmer grow his crop, grow his farm. Amen? Now, go to slide four. And it says this. We're going to come back to slide one and two later, but let's go to slide four. Genesis 2, verse 8 and 9. It says this. Then Adonai, Elohim, planted a garden in the east of in Eden in the east. So now we know he's a farmer because he planted a garden, right? And he put the man whom he had formed. Then Adonai Elohim caused to sprout from the ground every tree that was desirable to look at and good for food. Amen. So we see that God had always a plan and his plan was, uh, he could have been, uh, God was, could be a dentist. He could be any profession. He chose to be a gardener because when you garden or you farm, you can have multiplication by just planting and watering and all the other things that involved, involved those things. Amen. Slide five says this. Jesus later tells us that, that his father is a farmer. We are used to the, to, uh, the translation in John 15, 1, which says, my father is the vine grower, right? But the Greek, uh, uh, Jorgos, and the Latin is Ericola. Both Jorgos and Ericola mean farmer. Not simply vine grower, as we see in Virgil's uh, uh, this word here on agri agriculture and the name George, which means farmer. God is the one who gives life. He nourishes. He tends. He brings to fruition. God is a farmer. And you must look at God like a farmer. I mean, all through the Bible, whatever you sow is what you reap. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest, right? Spring and all these things, that uh, the seasons and everything. So God is a farmer. Hallelujah. Uh, slide 6 says this, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are God's co-worker. You are God's what? Field. We are God's field. Amen. We're God's building. Hallelujah. And so we can see here that God is a farmer and he's put the earth here. And I, I was thinking, and you can think with me also, imagine this earth, which is round. The earth is not flat. If you think the earth is flat, something's wrong with you. The earth is round. <clears throat> and because the earth is round, um, you think about if you're a farmer and you created the earth, you have to make the earth with enough water sources to water all this land that you have. One of the, the fears of a farmer is it doesn't rain. It doesn't rain. Amen. And so God said, I'm going to get, cause you to have rain. I, actually, we can we can go here in, a, in slide um, eight real fast. Slide eight says this: Deuteronomy eleven fourteen fifteen. Then I will provide rain for your land in season. The autumn and spring rains that you may gather your grain, new wine, and oil. And I will provide grass in the field for your livestock, and you will eat and be satisfied. So God has a plan, and his plan was to put um, uh, land here, and we farm the land, and we eat from the land. But if you put this in the, in the spiritual realm, the, the fruits are people, are souls. They're, they're souls. God wants to leave the earth here uh, and in this state, of this state that it is in right now, and he wants to have a whole new family with no weeds. You hear what I said? No weeds. Weeds will choke your garden. What is weeds in the, in, in, for us in the spiritual realm? What's weeds? Sinners. A sinner is weed. And that's why right now they are intermingled together. Let, let's read uh, uh, slot 7, Matthew 8, Matthew uh, 13, slot 7. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? And, and how then does it have what? Tares or weeds, right? Verse 28, he said to them, an enemy has done this, the devil. He's the one that really corrupted 
the family of God, right? The enemy has done this. And it says, do you want us to then to go and gather them up? If you are a farmer, if, if you are a farmer or if you are a gardener and you see weeds in your, pla- in your, your, um, your, your, your plants, you don't just pull everything up. Many times you just let it go until it's time for it to harvest. Then you separate them, right? And this is what the earth is. The, 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 the rapture is a time to separate the tares from the weeds, from, from the, the, the fruits. Amen? It's a time to separate those. Let's read, let's read it again. It says, verse 20, uh, 29. But he says, no, if you gather, uh, lest you, while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. So you don't want to uproot the fruit with the weeds. You want to just wait until it's time. Well, that's the rapture. You understand that? Let's look at it again. And it says this. Let, let both grow together until the harvest. You let them both grow. If you can't pull the weeds out, let them grow together. And then when it's time to harvest, separate them. Amen. Let us both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat until my barn. Well, if you want to burn the bundles, there's a good place to burn bundles. Hell. It's either you burn them in hell or you burn them on God's farm. And so we're getting to the point now where it's time for there to be a great harvest on the earth. Some of you saw the revival in Asbury, 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 right? Asbury. I was watching it last night. It has spread now to other campuses. It is still growing. It's still moving, but it's moving in other locations now. Amen. And, um, so we're seeing that God is moving on the earth. I, I, look, I look at it like this. and I mean, this, you can go so many directions with this message. Um, I look at it like this. When you work on a farm, and we have a family in our church who has a farm or, or garden. Well, it's pretty big. It's a garden. It's literally a semi-farm because it's so big. Uh, it's not just a garden. It's huge. So, uh, and I had the, the uh, opportunity to work there last summer. And imagine... When a farmer or a gardener, he knows he has a particular plant or a particular fruit, and he knows in, in his, his mind and in his season that this thing only has a little bit more time before it's completely mature. And I must pull, a, a, a grab it, I must get it, or it's going to go on the bad side. It's going to get rotten and won't be any good anymore. Well, don't you think God knows when the earth is at the place where I have to start harvesting right now because now it's the season. Now it's time. And this is where we are today in the, in the earth. I, I look at it like this. Um, there's 8 billion people, around 8 billion people in the world. 8 billion potential harvests for God. We don't know how many will be born again, I mean, of the 8 billion but 8 billion people, let's say, there's 8 billion. And these are the potential uh, harvests for God. That family can be huge if we added 8 billion. Well, we know that's not going to happen. Not all 8 billion of the people are going to say, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen? They're not, just, they're, they're not just going to do that because they have their own beliefs and their own ways. And, of course, the enemy is going to work against them also. And you're going to have to fight for your salvation. Amen? So with this earth that God has given us, and um, uh, he even asked us, he said, and this is one of the things that we're going to have to do. We are going to have to start praying specifically that the Lord sends laborers into the field. That's one prayer that has to be prayed more consistently and more often. There are not enough laborers into the field. Amen. Let's look at slide nine. It says this, James 5. Be patient then, brethren, uh, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the what? There he is again. God's the farmer. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. 
patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains, right? The New Living Translation said this, Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. Everybody say ripen. Well, the earth is about to ripen. That's, how, that's where we are now. The earth is about to ripen. And have you noticed this? And when I was studying this, have you noticed this? That all of a sudden, the, the uh, spiritual form, the spiritual forms are about to ripen. It's about to be picked. But the natural forms, they're trying to get rid of them. All the natural forms. I mean, I, I have a list. Let me read, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, so you understand what's going on. A lot of people are just asleep. They don't know what's going on. And here's what it says. Are you ready? Hallelujah. Now, there is, you know, and I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the, the, the four horses of apocalypse. And most people know about that. But one particular horse I want to talk about today, uh, the third horse. The third horse of the book of Revelation is the, the, uh, the black horse. It's called the black horse of famine, which brings with it global food shortage. This horse is, is as black as tar. He's really black, dark black. Um, you can hear his hooves pounding, his flanks heaving. You can see his nostrils flaring as his great rage focuses on the human race. And have you noticed there, the, all the governments are trying to control their farmers? They're trying to take away the, 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 the ingredients they need to, to grow a great farm. They're trying to do everything to take away the rights of farmers. Why is that? Because this has something to do with that black horse. There is supposed to be over 2 billion people who die of hunger during the tribulation period. 2 billion. You understand that? Well, how do you do that? The way you do that is you control the food supply, the world food supply. And they're doing that now. Let me show you something. It says this. Um, he, he comes to bring global famine. Supermarkets will be stripped bare. Civil riots will break out all over for lack of food. Now, have you noticed? I don't, maybe it's not just you or me, but I have been coming to my local supermarket here in my area for 25 years. The same store. They might renovate them, but it's the same store. And I go to about three or four of them. And I have never, ever remembered there being so much space in between the aisles now. There is so much meters that before you could barely walk. They had so much supply, so much toilet paper and soap and all everything. Now, if you go to the store now, the, the aisles are this. Why are you thinking, where's all, the, where's all of the stuff? Well, it's, it's, it's part of the black horse. It's part of the supply that will eventually diminish and almost be nothing left. If you think, don't think these things are happening, go to your supermarket and find out and look at some old pictures and you'll find out this is what's happening. Okay, so the rider of the black horse holds up a, um, um, let me read this part. He, he comes to bring global famine, supermarkets will be stripped bare, civil rights will break out over the lack of food, people will begin to know the aching and clawing sensation of true hunger. And it could, it could happen across America and the nations of the world very soon. I'm reading. The rider on the black horse holds up a balance and scales, declaring how much one simple meal will cost. The sum of a day's wages. There will not be enough to share with family or friends, just one meal for one day's wage. Starving people in the coming global famine of the Great Tribulation will kill each other in order to eat. I'm telling you, I'm preaching you a true message today. The Antichrist will have complete control over all the food on the planet. 
Remember, you cannot buy, you cannot sell unless you have the mark. It says this, The oil and wine discussed in the book of Revelation are food for the wealthy, also controlled by the Antichrist. These rulers and their subordinates will stock their shelves with choice products from state-owned supermarkets, but the masses will starve to death. The rich people will save up all the good things for themselves, but the, the common people will, will starve. Amen? These, uh, um, it says this, um, but the, the masses will starve to death. Exactly what happened in the Holy Coast as Hitler and his Nazi regime had the finest of everything, but right outside the door were the Jews who were starving to death. Right outside. Just feet away. It says the shadow of the coming black horse is hovering over America. Listen, it says this. It says um, the, in the U.S. farmland, U.S. farmland has been purchased by corrupt corporations hiding their true identities. China... Everybody say China. And most of this happens because of China. China has purchased 2% of more of, the fo- uh, more of the following states' farmland. Now listen to this list. It's amazing. China owns farmland in the U.S. and probably other countries too, probably ours also. Now what, here's what it says. It says, Washington State, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, Maine, and Michigan. These are states where China owns farm land. Now, when I did the study with this, I found this out. The reason why is because they don't have enough farmland in China to farm. And they got too many people. Now, remember... Uh, we're in the we're in the brinks the brink of a third world war. If you don't know that, read the newspaper. Okay, someone started, someone stopped, tried to stop it. So we're we're we had prayer on Wednesday, and we mentioned how we don't revival does not need a World War Three that will slow things down. It will hinder things. We don't need that. We have to pray against that. But the thing is, you remember the Bible talks about during the tribulation period that one nation from the north comes down to Israel and the Bible calls Israel the pleasant land. Why is it a pleasant land? Have you ever been to Israel? Nobody farms like Israel, Israelis. They can grow anything in sand. In sand. Well, when there's a global famine, uh, there are going to be a country from the north. Some people say it's uh, uh, Russia, of course, or Turkey. Who knows which one? Because they're both north. Who could it be? It doesn't matter who, who, who it is right now. What matters is this, is they try to come down to Israel because they know that they have an almost an unlimited supply of food and can grow anything. I mean, I was in Israel four years ago. Uh, with mom and Susanna and some other people, a whole group to tour people with the uh, Sid Roth. And we went down there, and every day it was a buffet of food. I mean, they had stuff I never saw before fruit, vegetables, dates, uh, all kinds, pomegranates, all kinds. They can grow it all in, in, in the, the desert, in Gaza, in Samaria. They can grow it anywhere. Everything their hands touch just grows. Well, when Russia and China see that, they're going to want to come down and take possession of that. And that's where we are headed to right now. And remember, I told you last week that, that most of the tribulation um, um, geography will take place in the Middle East. And it will always include China, and it would, in, would include Israel, of course, and the Middle East, Eastern nations. Okay, And we're seeing more and more of that. And so it, as when God looks at this from his position, looking down, all he sees is harvest, and it's almost time to uh, call in the harvest. Now, we have in, in, in America, and I'm sure here too, machines called, called I'm see, see if I can say this word, um, um, 
It is called a combine. You're there, a combine, yes. It's called a combine. Now, this combine, you only, you can't use a combine in the garden, okay? It's huge. A combine can only be used on a farm, but a big farm. I mean, this thing is bigger than four or five story of a building. It's huge. The, the tires on it, and but it can it can reap masses of wheat all at the same time, and they have six and seven and eight all in a row, and they're all going at a certain speed. And now these combines have GPS. They don't even need a driver now. They have computers. They can literally keep step all the way to reap all the harvest. Well, imagine if each combine was a church. And side by side, we can reap such a harvest in the last days and reap and reap and reap and reap until we can't reap no more. Amen. So look at look how God looks at things. God sees souls. God sees wheat. God sees wheat. God sees wheat. Wheats are souls. He wants souls. Hallelujah. He wants a bigger, bigger family. And it's almost time. I, I, I was picking some, some um, um, I'm trying to remember, squash last summer at, this, at one of our, our family's farm, or, uh, gardens. And I, pick, and I saw this squash, and I thought, this has to be overgrown. There's no way this squash should be this big. I mean, this thing is, Goliath would say, this is big. <laughs> I mean, it's big. But it was almost overripe, overdone. Well, if any, any, any of you thought like me, um, I told Susanna a while back, I said, I'll be honest with you, honey, I think there's just too many people on that planet right now. There's too many people. You say, why do you say that? I said, every time you, you're, when you're in a car, you go to, to, to drive, someone steps in front. You go to back up, there's somebody in back. You go to the right, there's somebody to the left. Everywhere, there's no space anymore. There's people everywhere. Well, it's time to harvest. It's time to harvest. Amen. If you have a garden and you, there's no space for one more grape, it's time to cut them. All the space is taken. Now, I know the earth is huge, and I know there's a, a lot of land that's not even uh, occupied. But where the people live, it's masses of people. You can't even walk. I was in India, and India is the second largest nation, and um, in, in a place called Hyderabad. And in Hyderabad, I'm in this hotel, and it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I look out the window, and it's just like you would think it's 10 in the morning. There's that many people out there still walking. Say, where are they going? 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, where are they going? It's like life never, doesn't stop. It's just continuous people, 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 people. Well, it's harvest. Now, remember, there is a, a number. Everybody say a number. There is a number that God has in his mind that even Jesus doesn't know, as far as I know, uh, concerned. A number that Jesus says, when this number da, 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 hits, then that's the fullness of time. It's time for the rapture. It's time to separate the, the tares from the, the uh, wheat. Time to separate. Well, we're in separation time. Jesus is about to come. And if you don't know, go to your supermarket and see the spaces between the aisles. <laughs> there is a famine headed our way. It doesn't seem like it right now because you, yeah, you can buy. But I mean, I, I, just, I just was in the store the other day. And I, said, I said, wait a minute. Why is there so much space? I mean, I was here two months ago and man, you couldn't even, you have to move, do a little dance to get through. Now there's so much space in the aisle. What's going on here? Why are they telling the farmers you can only have this so much of this and so much of that and we can't have any more? Why is this? Because they want to control the food supply. And if they can control the food supply, they can force you to do what they want to do. That's where we're headed. Amen? Now, I want to read this to you and then I've got to stop because I'm already... Um, Getting to the end, well, my message is, just, let me see something here. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Oh, that was really exciting. Hallelujah. So I want to read something to you here. 
And this is what it's called. It's called uh, Bible, Bible Harvest Cycles. Okay? In Matthew 13, 27, I think we read it already. Matthew 13, uh, um, um, 27. Um, let's, go, let's go to uh, slide 10. Yeah. And it says this, Matthew 13, 36 through 43. Jesus, Jesus, this Mr. Crowd, went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds, the weeds in the field. And no farmer likes weeds in his field. No gardener wants weeds in his field. Verse 37, he replied, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. 38, the field is the world, and the good seed represents the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. Right? And it says this, the harvest is the end of, of the eight, well, well, let's verse 39. And the enemy who sows them, the, the weeds, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are collected and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will um, weed out of his kingdom every cause of sin and all who practice lawlessness. And they will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears, let him hear. You see that? So you see the, the devil is the one who sows bad weeds and tries to contaminate the harvest. He's doing everything he can to contaminate the harvest. And God says, we don't want, uh, I don't want my harvest contaminated. I want it to be pure, no sin at all, so that when we go to heaven, it's going to be just all glorious, all holy, all righteous, all clean, all pure. Hallelujah. That's what God wants. Now, let's look at this. 